Um, before I introduce the speakers, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Squamish peoples. Quest University Canada sits on the Squamish traditional territory and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work, learn, and live in this blessed territory. This first session has five speakers and then we'll have a short break before our final showcase panel. Uh, our first speaker is Luisa Figueiredo, and she is talking to us about sex education in Brazil. Please welcome, oh God, did we start without her? All right, here we go, please welcome Luisa. Hi everyone. Uh, happy to see you guys after four years here. So, I would like to start off by saying that my name is Luisa Figueiredo, and for my undergraduate thesis, I've created a podcast about comprehensive sex education in Brazil. So, just an overall of my presentation. First, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of an introduction about what I'm going to talk give you some key terms, then I'm gonna go on to present you an academic justification that I've used to create this podcast. Later on, I'm gonna show you guys my process of addressing this issue and asking, what can I do about it? Later on, I'll say you what's next beyond this presentation. So first, I would like to ask the audience to raise their hands if they feel like throughout their middle school, high school, or even your first year as undergrad, you felt like you could have had a better sex ed experience. You could have learned more, you could have known more. Well, as you can see around, many people feel the same way as you do, and this is a problem everywhere. So to start off, I would like to first define what is comprehensive sex ed. My definition goes according to the UN guide guidelines and standards for comprehensive sex education that was created after long-standing research in many countries all around the world. So according to the UN, comprehensive sex education is a curriculum-based process of teaching and learning about cognitive, emotional, and physical and social aspects of your sexuality. The goal of comprehensive sex ed is also to ensure that you know what are your rights and to know ways to how to keep them and what can you do about it. So why this issue matters? Why did I make a whole presentation about it and dedicated four years of my undergrad to it? It matters because it affects many aspects of all of our lives. Um, here's the table with some areas that sex ed and sexuality just in general affects our lives. As you can see, the first one, it's relationships. It does affect your relationship with yourself, your relationship with your friends, your romantic or not romantic relationships, um, how your family sees you and how you see your family. Uh, sexuality also is very connected with your values, your rights, and your culture. Then, Depending on how you experience sexuality, uh, you might experience gender in a way that both of them affect each other. Both of these concepts affect each other. Um, violence and staying safe is also something that is directly correlated to your sexual aspect of your life. It depends on how safe you are walking around the world and depending on which country you live in, your levels of safety might change. Um, your skills for health and well-being also are affected by it. It affects the type of resources or information you get about that information. And your human body and development is also affected, as well as sexuality, sexual behavior, sexual and reproductive health. So let's go to the academic justification. Before I go too much into this part of it, I would like to give you a little bit of a personal background. So, if you don't already know, uh, I'm originally from Brazil. 
I've lived there for 18 years of my life, and it's where I call home. Um, Brazil is located in Latin America, and it's the six, top six country in, regarding population. For you to get a little bit of notion, the state of Sao Paulo has a bigger population than the whole country of Canada. Um, and I'm very proud to be Brazilian. I'm proud of my people, I'm proud of my city, um, the Brazilian music, I'm proud of our cuisines, and I'm proud of how Brazilians go throughout their lives showing what it means to be Brazilian in the world. Um, but something that I'm not particularly proud of is how we deal with public health uh, issues. So now I'm gonna show you some statistics. Um, six out of 10 of teenagers aged between 15 to 19 in Brazil don't use a condom in any sexual relationship. Um, HIV cases have increased by 85% in the last 10 years among young people. And by young people, they mean um, individuals between 15 years old and 25 years old. Uh, in comparison with other nations, Brazil has record high rates of early pregnancy. And in Brazil, women are sexually assaulted every 10 minutes and murdered every seven hours. Lastly, um, Brazil has the highest rate of trans murder in the entire globe. All these statistics are, affect many people's lives and they are a very serious issue. All of the statistics as well are part of sex ed. Those issues should be discussed in the classroom so people can know that they are even an issue and then know what kind of resource to navigate going through those issues. In a research made in more than 100 countries, I mean 100 cities in Brazil, it was found that 54% of the Brazilian population agrees to have sex ed and believe it is important to have sex ed in schools. But unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, the Brazilian government, especially this past few years, it's been really against sex ed, it doesn't encourage it, and the few implementations we have, they're being cut down in a federal level. By looking at such a big issue, I've come to the question of what can I do about it? It's such a big issue and I'm just me. Is there anything I can do? Um, so I've decided to create just a podcast because this is the way that I've found to address those issues and share some of the, sm the small knowledge that I have regarding sex ed that I've learned both in my experience in Brazil and throughout my education in Quest and other uh, extracurricular, extracurricular activities I've had here. So my podcast has four episodes in which I talk about things such as STIs, I discuss about birth control, I talk about um, uh, ho homophobic crimes and legal protection that individuals can help. And I also discuss um, some of the most common questions that people have about sex ed, such as, uh, is this gonna harm my child? What is about? Uh, where can I learn more? Those four episodes are just a jump start for something that I hope to be an ongoing work. And they are all in the Q&A format, which means I've created some key questions and I answer them. And it's very important to me that all of my podcast work, it's in an accessible language that anyone with no previous knowledge can understand it. And I try to contextualize the education I'm bringing in to my audience. In other words, I make reference to uh, pop culture. I bring um, some Brazilian examples to the audience about things they're happening. 
And my goals for this podcast is to advocate for ongoing comprehensive sex education throughout the world and more specifically, have a podcast target for Brazilian audience. Unfortunately, in my own personal research, I couldn't even find many to listen and to learn more. Uh, most podcasts that I found talking about this issue are in English created um, in the UK or in the US. So having one that is made by a Brazilian for Brazilians, it does make a difference uh, in your learning process about sex ed. Uh, this is a photo of me recording my <laughs> podcast uh, in the recording studio with the help of the recording studio coordinators and many other people on campus. So what's next? This presentation, as I've already said, is just a start. In my long journey that I hope to be working even more with sex ed and helping more people to learn about it. Uh, I still think that we should demand that more public policies are made in Brazil. That should never stop. But at the same time, in a hopeful future where that does happen, I still think online content should still be created because um, presenting things from outside the classroom in any subject, such as YouTube videos, clips, music, always uh, improves and encourages the students to learn more. So yes, governmental level change has to happen, but creating virtual content it's also a way to give voice to different peoples because the Brazilian experience, of course, is not monolithic. Everybody has a different take, even if it's the same topic. And thank you so much, everyone. Hello. Um, Brazil is one of the most Christian countries, um, and other things have also been happening. Uh, I believe that because the U.S. is such a big country and it has such proximate, proximity with Brazil, uh, everything that happens in a country like the U.S. also affects uh, how people see. So there is the rise of many politicians who see um, governmental policies made by the right wing in the US uh, very inspiring. So they've taken a different position on the way they have done in the past. Also, Brazil, in the end of the day, is a, a Latino country. And we do tend to be a bit more conservative in certain issues compared to other countries. So, yeah. Are there parts of Brazil that would be more open and free to come free? So, are there parts where it would be easier to promote what you're talking about, which I think is great? Uh, you know, early adopters kind of philosophy, and then you start with the other, uh, the early adopters, and then you can, you know, get the followers after that. Yeah, I, I think that's a great idea. Um, but because of my personal background in relation with Brazil, I've mainly focused on my research uh, on, with Brazilian papers, but I've also uh, studied throughout the UN guidelines, other research that were made in other countries, but I believe the work that I would like to do in the future focuses on that, and also my experience as a sex educator has always involved um, university, high school level of sex ed. But I do think that's a great idea and it should be done. Yeah. Alexis. So for me, I think I remember a slide saying like it was open sex education in Brazil. Is there like any classes you have in school? Um, so as of now, it's legal. You can do it, uh, but there's no policies like you have to do it. This is how. You have to do it, this is how you say it. So certain schools uh, do that, some don't. Uh, my personal experience was uh, th there is a Madison University, doctor university, 
uh, nearby my city and some volunteers went by and they showed us a lot of pictures of illnesses and we call it a day and that was success for my experience. Hi, everybody. Technical difficulty. Yeah, that works. Everyone hear me? Okay. I think we're good, yeah. So our next speaker is Samuel Hoyt, who will be talking to us about Gamergate. Um, he's already up here, but let's welcome him anyway. <laughs> Uh, hello. The first two times I gave this presentation, I had that lung disease that's been going around. So I've never actually done this in front of people and it's a lot scarier. Luckily my parents are here, which really takes the pressure off. <laughs> Love you. All right. So hello, my name is Sam Hoyt. I'm going to be presenting a portion of my keystone, Understanding Gamergate, how and why it functions. And slight spoilers, this is a topic about the alt-right, so I want to give a brief content warning. Um, I want to warn that because we are dealing with the alt-right, there are many topics that are going to put some into some emotional danger, especially those who have past experiences with said topics. So here's my content warning. If you wish to step out for this presentation, I won't be hurt. We don't judge here. Right on, brave souls. So, a few things to know before we begin. Around 2013, hate group participation as tracked by the Southern Poverty Law Center dropped by about 30%. Far-right patriot groups dropped by about 20%. Hate crimes, however, dropped by 3%. What this indicates is that far-right extremism was not leaving, but decentralizing. Hate was moving online. This was not isolated to the US. In the years between 2014 and 2020, there was a significant rise in far-right movements across North America and Europe. Almost all of them shared something interesting in common. They were all predominantly started and organized online. This was pre-pandemic too, so that was pretty noteworthy. Far-right movements began to gain immense political power too, such as in France, that was a scary election recently, that was a bit too close for comfort. Uh, also in Germany, in Sweden, and, of course, there are plenty more examples to choose from as well. <laughs> there are plenty more examples to choose from as well, but where did all of this come from and why is it so suddenly online? My keystone is my answer to those questions. It is an explanation of what Gamergate was and how it prefigured the alt-right. For the purposes of this presentation, we are going to be focusing on just the first bit, answering the question of what was Gamergate? But first, Let's define some terms. To simplify beyond reason, the far right is an umbrella term for fascist, fascistic, fringe, and often violent groups with a right-wing ideology. When, when I say alt-right, I mean the umbrella term for the online segment of the far right. The term alt-right was an intentional rebranding of fascist ideology by this neo-Nazi up top named Richard Spencer. Below him is a picture of a Seattle man punching him in the face. I included for obvious reasons. Um, and if anyone's from Seattle here, some Seattle pride for you. Um, and the reason I'm talking about the alt-right now, and the reason the alt-right movements matter at this moment in history in particular, is that they have accumulated enough power to shift politics in their favor. They have entered our lexicon, and they have put their people in their places of power, even to the presidency. 
So where did they learn their specific political playbook and where did they get enough power to enact it? I argue that it all started when a bitter man posted a rant about an ex and targeted this post towards Nazis. A play-by-play -play history of the harassment campaign known as Gamergate is not something anyone should spend any time to, let alone a year and a half, but here we are, so here's the briefest summary I can manage. It starts in 2013. A video game designer, Zoe Quinn, breaks up with her boyfriend, Aaron Goni, in late 2013. The ex-boyfriend, Goni, posts a bitter, misogynistic screed about them called the Zoe Post. And this post is long. It's about half the length of my keystone, 20,000 words or so. Goni was hoping to use the internet as his personal army and this piece of paper to attack Quinn. Most of the claims bashing Zoe Quinn, he admits later, are either lies, exaggeration, or typos. Regardless of the ex-boyfriend lies, reactionary corners of the internet oblige, and a harassment campaign begins under the guise of a movement demanding ethics in games journalism. Let's speed up a bit. People's privacy is destroyed, lives are ruined, careers in the gaming industry are ended, and suing mass mules of fuels a massive flame war across Tumblr, across Twitter, across 4chan. If you don't know what 4chan is, just picture Nazis. Men's rights activists, reactionaries, neo-reactionaries, anti-progressives, anti-feminists, the scrapes game developers, and other groups that hate the current direction of the culture war co-opt the whole mess and the harassment grows exponentially. The movement is dubbed Gamergate by, for some reason, Firefly star Adam Baldwin. Targets of harassment begin disconnecting their phones and moving to safe houses only to be stalked in their location revealed by advocates for Gamergate. Everything I've just said just took place within two weeks of the upload of the first so post. Fast forward to 2021 and Gamergate is caught harboring and instructing a white nationalist and domestic terrorist how to build bombs. That was a fun wall of text, right? Sorry, I know. Fun walls of text and PowerPoints are not that appealing. I don't have, I don't need you to remember much of what I just said. All I need you to remember is that A, Gamergate was a harassment campaign, and B, Gamergate pretended it was not. The question of what was Gamergate is typically phrased as, was Gamergate a movement to demand ethical reform in games journalism, or was it actually an anti-feminist hate mob using ethics in games journalism as a smokescreen? But even that is kind of framing the question within the harassment campaign known as Gamergate's terms. The question should be, was Gamergate openly misogynist or a bunch of frustrated gamers misdirecting their anger into misogyny? And this is really a question of proportion. Did Gamergate know what they were? No one has numbers on Gamergate, in large part because its members often congregated on anonymous forums that disguised their numbers or created multiple fake accounts on multiple random websites. But the movement seemed to shake out into two groups, one small and one large. The first and smaller group wasn't necessarily interested in journalistic integrity, but found it a useful cover when harassing women and minority in the game space, and a, and a useful way to network with those who wanted to do the same. This is a group that, among a much longer list of crimes, drove three people from their homes, leaked private information of hundreds, sent armed SWAT teams to the houses of their critics with false reports, and encouraged many to kill their targets, or encouraged their targets to kill themselves. This was the first group, let's call them the alt-right. The second group, which by any estimation was much larger, sincerely believed that there was something wrong with games journalism, and were sincerely angry about it, hopefully. But they expressed this by endorsing and spending most of their time with Gamergate. Instead of meaningfully discussing ethics, they engaged with the alt-right knowingly and proclaimed just as often as they could how they were not part of the alt-right, how they did not know anything about the alt-right, how they couldn't do anything about the alt-right. And this is significant, they were not responsible for the alt-right. Let's borrow some terminology from the alt-right and call this second group normies. I'm gonna say alt-right a lot more in this presentation. But the alt-right was Gamergate, just as much as the normies were. This was the group that jumped on a post from an ex-boyfriend detailing his breakup with the game developer Zoe Quinn, a post that had been taken down from two different web forums and then rewritten and workshopped to appeal precisely to this audience, the alt-right. It was this group the alt-right, that invited the ex-boyfriend into a chat room to plan to, and I quote, how to get Zo Quinn to commit suicide. Gamergate, though on the face of it, a gaming-oriented subculture of the internet, really had nothing to do with games. It didn't begin with gamers. It began on 4chan's politically incorrect board, or poll board. Again, 4chan is Nazis. That's all you need to know. A sub-forum popular with also anti-feminists and pedophiles. But let's go back to those circles for a moment. 
It was the alt-right on 4chan's poll board that selected ethics in games journalism as a shield against criticism. It was the alt-right that selected it deliberately to appeal to gamers, people who were nervous about how games culture was changing and they wanted a boogeyman to blame for it, and people who were looking for any excuse not to listen to feminist critique. It was the alt-right that selected the name Gamergate from a TV celebrity tweet commenting on a video about Zoe Quinn's sex life. It was the alt-right that claimed Gamergate was a different movement from the already active harassment campaign, despite containing all the same people. This group, the alt-right, is where Gamergate came from, and it is near impossible to believe any member did not know that. And all of this was standard operating procedure for poll. It was all public record from about a month after everything began, and the rare instances where the normies actually didn't know anything about it, it was because they chose, or more likely pretended, they did not. The alt-right was not a fringe element of radicalized people aligned with the otherwise passive normies. Gamergate was an alt-right movement, and the normies aligned with them. So what were Gamergate's goals? What did these two groups want? What did they achieve? And what did they gain from allying with each other? Well, in the face of it, this last question is pretty basic. They deflected criticism from each other. Say you criticize a member of the alt-right for harassment or something much worse, and he can disappear into the crowd of normies saying, we're a legitimate movement. I'm not harassing anyone. I'm just here to talk about gaming ethics. And the second group would believe and defend him. Or them, but let's be honest, it's him. Criticize a member of the normie movement for their involvement, and he would say, you just won't take me seriously because you think I'm one of the alt-right. This was the completely symbiotic relationship between the normies and the alt-right. Without each other, Gamergate might have burned itself out within a couple months, but let's come back to this. What did Gamergate want? The short version, to quote David Fisher, is they wanted war. They wanted to destroy the other anywhere they found it. The core of Gamergate does not want to live in a feminist, anti-racist world, but also doesn't actually have the power to prevent one from existing. They do, however, have the power to impede it, to disrupt progress, to wrap bigotry in a bunch of political euphemisms to make it more culturally acceptable. This is a war in the sense of Norse mythology, a war that can't be won, but can be prolonged. Within that framework, they can achieve a few things. One was simply to make Zo Quinn and the many hundreds adjacent to Zo Quinn miserable. Any day these people wake up wondering, is it worth it to continue, is a victory. The other achievement was to make sure basically nothing these people say ever goes unchallenged. Anyone that discredits or attempts to discredit the Gamergate or the alt-right movement gets discredited themselves. Sarah Nyberg speaks out against Gamergate, falsely claimed that she has a history of pedophilia and white nationalism. Ian Chong mocks Gamergate, call him a racist and threaten his life. Tim Schafer mocked Gamergate at GDC, just call him a racist and then threatened to kill his doctor and leak his address. And the upsetting thing is that this works, at least some of the time. Studies show that reactionary comments can change how the public responds to a piece of media. And this intentional polarization for minorities within a community is largely what movements like Gamergate are for. To react so negatively as to make a reasonable statement seem like the far end of a spectrum, and to make the halfway point between a reasonable and bugfuck irrational statement seem like the moderate position. And that moderate position was the one carved out for normies to shift the acceptable political positions. With that said, what normies wanted to get out of their involvement with Gamergate was complicated. Their difficulty was that they couldn't admit publicly or to themselves that they and the worst elements of Gamergate want the same thing. They need to believe that they were morally righteous, that they were the good guys. But normies are starting to worry now that their participation in the culture that Zoe Quinn has been trying to reform might make them the bad guys. The alt-right was smart enough to feed reassurances that this token anti-harassment lip service was literally the best they could do, and they made the normies believe it. And this was the dance of Gamergate, getting someone dedicated to your cause by constantly reassuring them that they are nothing like you. So let's close with the big question. Why games? And honestly, the short answer is, why not games? <laughs> games culture has, presented, has always presented itself as a hobby for young, white, middle-class boys. It's always been bigger and more diverse than that, but that's how it was marketed, and that's who most felt gaming culture belonged to. As gaming culture grows bigger, there's suddenly room for those marginal voices that have always been there to make themselves heard. And as gaming becomes more mainstream, it's having its first brushes with serious, critical, and feminist analysis. This makes the people who have long felt gaming was theirs and theirs alone anxious and a little angry. They've invested a lot of time and a lot of effort into their identity and gaming culture, and they don't want it to change. These are not liberals or leftists in the gaming space. 
These people are, up till now, not politically engaged. What the, normie, what the alt right wants more than anything is to be the normies' first political entry point. And what the alt right sees in the normies, what they see in gaming culture, what they see in a sizable collection of aggrieved young white men, is an untapped market. Thank you for listening. Here are my sources. I'm sorry I swore, Mom and Dad. Oscar. God, I love this question. I get to talk more. Um, so as the far right um, mostly splintered out from multiple acts of terrorism that happened throughout the early 2000s, especially after 9-11, these groups started gaining less and less power as the FBI got a bit more interested in why there was suddenly a huge rise in right-wing terrorist attacks. And I think because of that, they started predominantly organizing online not intentionally or not organized by someone, they all seem to collectively move to online spaces where they can't be tracked, where they can not be monitored, and they can basically say whatever they want. And this was just a bunch of people, uh, they were basically just a bunch of nomads and they were boiling in this pot of anger and hate and waiting for something to spark it. And then Aaron Goni comes along and he lights a match and he throws the Zo post out to the Nazis and says, do something with this, and it makes a massive explosion, and now we have a still going on hate movement dedicated to three people and their families and their friends, and they're getting their people into the White House, and they're getting their people into Congress, they're getting their people into um, Seattle legislation as well. Uh, Katie. Are you asking, like, what do we do? Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of parallels between this and a bunch of other big movements. A hundred percent. How do you use what you've learned? Mm -hmm. Go further. The one, the one thing I can recommend all of us, um, us bleeding heart liberals and those who lie further left, is that what doesn't work, not that I have seen and not reliably, is an argument with a stranger on the internet in solving this problem. Rarely are they looking for an honest debate and rarely are they looking for their mind to change. They're looking for a space to say the most vile stuff they can in hopes of getting as much attention as possible. Um, what I recommend and what I've seen work far, far more is advocacy, progressive advocacy. Don't try to debate them out of their position. Give them a better culture to join. These people are not in Gamergate because they sincerely believe there's ethical violations in games journalism or they sincerely love the alt-right ideology. Most of them are in there because they have friends and they have a community. And I find the best way to get them out of such a toxic environment is not to debate them, but just give them a better community, one that actually supports them, one that treats them like a human. And I need to, I need to call on Gerhardt. <laughs> Gerhardt's been killing it today with these questions. Yeah, the red pill is a thing that was brought to gamer from Gamergate.
Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh man, I think to answer the first part of your question is, I'm glad I have Steve Bannon up here to reference. So as many of you know, or many of you may not know, Steve Bannon is from the website Breitbart. Um, hopefully you don't know this, and if you're learning about it right now, don't Google it. It's not worth your time. Breitbart became, was before 2014, a pretty fringe and low trafficked website, gaining about a thousand views a day um, out on their best days. And then a man by the name of Milo Yiannopoulos, who's one of the worst people on earth, um, started writing openly about Gamergate on Breitbart and all the thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who were very openly for Gamergate began using Breitbart as a place for news aggregation and to meet with fellow Gamergaters. And this blew Breitbart way out of like the fringe and into the mainstream to being discussed on CNN, to getting Steve Bannon and Milo Yiannopoulos an incredible amount of political power and leeway, to getting Trump to notice Steve Bannon, to getting Trump to realize Steve Bannon had really good political um, instincts, and then hiring Steve Bannon uh, to be his campaign manager. And boy, did that go well. Um, so basically, the entire Trump apparatus was orchestrated by someone who was a Gamergator. Um, and what do we do about this? That is a tough question. Um, if you are into politics, if you are into leftist spaces, if you are into community organizing, keep fucking doing that. Get the word out and just keep moving forward. Present a better story for these people, one that doesn't have bigotry and hate tied into it, one that has love and compassion and care for them as a human tied into it. That's what you can do. Thank you. Before, before you get off the stage, um, and uh, before we thank Hoyt, uh, we should also add a note of congratulations. Hoyt was awarded the honor of distinction for this keystone. Our next speaker is Jasper Olson talking us about talking to us about the Earth Caretaker Foundation. Please welcome Jasper. Okay. I hope I don't bore your ears off about talking about a nonprofit, so I'll try and spice it up as much as I can. Um, or maybe add like a little mild seasoning, if nothing else. So uh, Today I'm going to be presenting on the Earth Caretaker Foundation, merging education and conservation. So first off, I'm going to set the stage for you all and just talk about what I'm going to talk about in this presentation. So first, I'm going to set the stage by just giving a backstory about how this came into being, um, as well as talk about our goals for a nonprofit, uh, what Earth Caretaking is, at least how we would define it in our organization, um, and what our mission statement, vision, and approach are for this, as well as who is involved and how we're gonna bring in the dough, uh, as well as what we would like our legacy to be if we had that choice, um, as well as a take home message. Cool, so in the summer of 2020, I worked on a ranch in Southern California and there are these kids who lived there and they just wouldn't shut up about this outdoor school in Northern California called Headwaters Outdoor School. And they just raved about it and said that if I ever had the chance, I should go and check it out because I would probably feel very much at home there. Um, and I kind of forgot about that and worked the rest of the summer and fast forward to the winter. This is the winter of 2020 when COVID was in full swing 
and we are all viscerally feeling the pandemic. Um, and I was in full blown like seasonal depression mode and I was just thinking of sunny California and uh, the school popped back into my head. And I decided to call up the director of the school, found him online, and I asked if there's any way I could get my foot in the door. Right when he answered, he saw a hawk, and he was like, this is a good omen. I have a good feeling about this. So he was like, come as soon as you can. And so I went in the spring, and I, I got to the school, and it felt like home. It felt amazing. It was, it was a really awesome feeling. Um, and just like any good questie would, I was thinking about my purpose in life and who I am when I got to the school. And uh, so naturally I decided that after a month being there, I would go out and fast in the woods. And so, oh, this is still the story. Um, and so <laughs> I went out in the woods and I built this impromptu shelter and I curled up like a bear and for four days and five nights, I was there fasting and one day the sun was just beaming down on me, it was so hot and I barely had enough energy to even breathe and I fell asleep and I had this dream and in the dream it was a vision of being around a fire with some kids and we were storytelling and it was under a blanket of stars and it was at headwaters, like it was at that land, the land that I had just gotten to a month before and I, it was just this overwhelming feeling of connection and just belonging there in some, some odd way. So I went back to the school, told some mentors about it, and they really encouraged me to find a way to bring that vision into reality, which ended up being this idea for the nonprofit to try and set aside the land to preserve the land that the school is on, as well as preserve the school itself, because the guy who started it is pretty old school and he's, he's getting into his later years but nobody wants to step up and take over the school, take the responsibility. So I don't want to take over the school but find a way to keep it viable, keep the land and the school viable for years to come. And so I had a really good uh, some rest of the summer mentoring classes and I learned so much. Uh, and it was just in an incredible area just to the right that's Mount Shasta that white blob, that red dot obviously. Um, this is in Northern California again, and so this is 400 miles to the left of pretty much forested land crossing only two paved roads until you get to Highway 101 on the coast, so pretty beautiful spot. And so I got back to Quest and I took classes on ethics and ecology, I was so stoked on it, and even neurodevelopment and things a little bit outside that wheelhouse to to connect with, um, but it, really I was inspired to learn more about land management and conservation. And so this brings me into talking about the foundation in a little bit more of a technical way because a rather critical question arose when I got back to school and we were having these meetings with the foundation, how could we feel good about potentially redirecting funds from other nonprofits to ours? Like, why are we special? <laughs> and is there a niche? Uh, and so what is that niche? And we realize that just generally speaking, there's more of a, there's a, more of a need now than ever for land-based learning, especially uh, intentional ways of helping kids grow up emotionally, so like rites of passage, um, as well as community service. And we realize that Headwaters is really unique because it has this combination of philosophy as well as experiential learning. So it's a, it's a really unique spot um, and it's worth saving. And so our niche really is connecting outdoor education with conservation. And again, like I said, the school is in danger of downsizing, so there's no time like now to make something like this happen. However, there's a history already at Headwaters and it goes beyond 30 years and it goes beyond 300 years and likely 3,000 years as well. And that history is marked by the shadows of cultural genocide and the suppression of indigenous voices and traditions. And something that I learned through Quest and being here in the Squamish community and talking with elders is this idea of decolonization. Um, and to be completely honest, I don't know exactly how it would look like 
at this point with our foundation um, or even on an individual level. But a lot of questions arose because of that, such as how could this be done? What would the proper protocol be? Where would we start? So we're still grappling with this inquiry, um, but it is a key conversation point moving forward and for our future in-person meetings. And so part of our goal is to use our experiential learning model to exemplify how to interact with nature as if it were a being in and of itself, as, is, as if it were alive, instead of, say, just an arrangement of ecosystem services. Nothing against those, Sasha. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this leads us into talking about what earth caretaking is. And so part of my keystone has been trying to understand how indigenous peoples on the west coast have been ecologically minded to gain a deeper understanding into the historical precedent of caretaking. So why does it matter? Where did it come from? Um, and so here are two titles amongst many others that helped guide my learning and our organization hopes that by understanding some of the existing approaches to caretaking that there already are and have been around since time immemorial, uh, we hope that we can be better informed as, so as to um, find a way to help. And it's important to note that caretaking can look different depending on where you are. Like, obviously, if you're going to set a controlled burn in a forest like at Headwaters to control, control the understory and maybe promote new growth and enhance the soil, that's all fine and dandy. But if you try and do that in your backyard in suburbia, I mean, God help you, right? So uh, there are three pillars that we've deduced that we kind of narrowed it down to that really apply to our organization and to headwaters, but also can be applied more broadly. And those are assessment, implementation, and education. And so in starting any nonprofit, uh, the struggle is real to concisely state what you stand for, and it, it's really hard even in this presentation just talking about what we are um, but in short it's to inspire people to be earth caretakers curious about the natural world and concerned for the well-being of ecosystems our vision is that we envision an ongoing learning and sharing atmosphere at headwaters which includes tending the land for generations to come our organization's approach is this proposal to integrate the school and land under one umbrella as a nonprofit. And the first step is completing this keystone, which conveniently acts as an organizational model for the foundation itself. Um, and the next step is getting certified in the state of California as a tax exempt nonprofit, which will help donors. Uh, we're gonna help raise funds, hopefully by utilizing uh, existing streams of revenue because that's easy and it's, it's simple and it's already there, such as tuition, retreat fees, and souvenir sales from the school. But as an organization, we, help to, we hope to do things like crowdfunding and find ways to uh, expand our, our fundraising campaign, as well as applying for grants and having all of this put together by the summer of 2022. So the folks who are spearheading this operation, we got Tim Corcoran, myself, my brother, Cameron Olson, and our attorney, Andrew Creeley. And all of our names sound rather white and male, and it is because they are. Uh, and we, we recognize that this is a severe limitation, um, and it's also a bias in how we conduct ourselves as a business. Um, however, we want to diversify and bring in different voices and experiences to our board, and we're committed to demonstrating a change through the actions that we plan to take. So we love our legacy to be an updated school curriculum that reflects our values. Currently, some of the programs are, how do you say it, old school. <laughs> um, and so moving away from themes like cultural appropriation, as well as preserving the land under one title, see a potential collaboration or co-management of land with conservation organizations, uh, or perhaps tribal communities in the locale if that is appropriate. And just continuing the legacy of 30 years of excellence in outdoor education that Tim Corcoran started and offer more scholarships and grants in addition to the Walker Hup Fund, which helps take underprivileged youth up to this school on a, a scholarship. So the take home message is that 
Uh, the climate and culture and biodiversity all around the world are obviously in deep peril and it's a crisis on many levels. But the good news is that everybody can do something and it's up to us what we can do to help the next generations. So this is just our small way of trying to help and though this is merely a proposal, we are in the beginning stages of implementation, taking slow steps, but we're taking steps towards our goal nonetheless. And we're inspired by the words of George Washington Carver, the man who invented 300 different uses for the peanut. <laughs> Where there is no vision, there is no hope. So I turn that around and offer it as a question to us all, what is your vision? Thank you, and bef I would like to acknowledge um, and personally thank Dr. Curtis Wasson for your continued mentorship and guidance. Uh, it's much appreciated, as well as my parents, my dad and grandma who are sitting here, and, and, all, of, and all of my uh, peers and colleagues and friends who have given feedback and shared insights and concerns <laughs> as well. So, thank you. I think your hand was up first, Matt. Yeah, uh, so you talked about uh, caretaking for the land, and, and one example you gave was burning. Mm -hmm. um, and my question is, is burning, as you stated, is it, is it suitable for every place that you're, you're at? How do you plan to teach for a wider kind of ecosystem uh, instead of just a large forest? Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's a really good question. So I don't know if you all heard his question, but it's why would you use burning as a caretaking methodology? Um, and it's, it's, like I said, it's really context dependent, but it's a good question. And since it is so context dependent, I'm not sure if like I have a really solid answer, but um, one thing that conservationists have done in the past is consult tribal communities, like go to uh, museums or go to uh, community headquarters and see if any elders are there and would be willing to take them out and talk to them about the history of cultural burning. But if there isn't history of cultural burning, you gotta be super careful because the whole state of California is a tinderbox. Um, and was there another part of your question? For sure, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and so part of what we're trying to say is that caretaking can look different depending on where you are. I, I didn't get into specifics of what that could look like in your backyard, but you could go to the uh, garden center and get some native plants and help the pollinators that way. Um, and you could tend those plants and stuff and develop a relationship like that. Or you could plant a vegetable garden or something like that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Katie. Um, what does the process of increasing diversity on your board look like to help ensure that it is in fact a regulation? For sure, yeah. It's it's just it's gonna take time and um, we're we're intentionally going really slow with this, like especially where we are right now, because we don't wanna get into a place where like further down the line we realize that our decision making and our ideas and everything are so limited because it's such a limited like lens that we're looking through. And so it's, it's best if we can do what we can now and, and, and reach out and just get this name out there. So, yeah.
Okay, our next speaker of the session is Georgia Smith um, with her talk to the woods. Please welcome. <laughs> I have been receiving gifts from the earth for as long as I have been breathing. I was a toddler eating cucumbers in my aunt and uncle's garden. I was a child being rocked and spun by the ocean beside my cousins on the rocks that have long united generations of our family. I was a visitor to the tide pools that hid fresh mussels. I was surrounded by love every time my family would have our annual lobster dinner. All these experiences and foods were gifted to us by the land. My first intense connection to a food plant was blueberries. On the ancestral lands of the Pawtucket peoples in what is now called Rockport, Massachusetts, my cousins and I would visit the blueberry bushes for the perfect crop of berries for pie. We would wake up to a humid house in early July, and after the first swim of the day, we would head to the promised land. The berry branches would snag in our jeans as sweat beaded on our foreheads we would end up storing most of the berries in our bellies rather than our buckets. The berries we picked would be handed off to our culinary leader, my uncle, who would begin to make our bounty into a feast. The pies would be carved with our initials and baked to golden brown perfection. Though I didn't have this language or awareness during childhood, I want to thank that sacred land and the Pawtucket stewards for these gifts. I want to thank that land for creating me we, human peoples, are of the earth, and the earth is of us. Every time I see my root-like veins or a bit of my tangled hair, I am reminded of my wildness and all that I have in common with my more-than-human relatives. We are part of the natural world, even if industrialization and capitalism obscure that. I also want to thank the land here that we all find ourselves on today. I write, learn, teach, and cook on the sacred and stolen land of the Squamish peoples. I cannot separate my happy life on this land from the violence inflicted upon them and upon the earth. I carry and maintain this violence wherever I land as a 14th generation settler. I Every day, I benefit from the colonial violence carried out by my ancestors and extended by me. My occupation on this land, my consumption of foods farmed by the agro-industrial complex, and my enrollment at Quest are a few examples of the structural violence that we settlers contribute to every day. Settler colonialism is a process, not a distinct event. It's a project which all settlers help to sustain. I am not guilty of my ancestors' exact crimes, but I am inextricably embedded and complicit in the ongoing violence that they made possible. Therefore, I am accountable and responsible for helping others fight against the systems which were built to benefit people who look like me. I am incredibly grateful for all of my teachers, indigenous and colonized and those betwixt, human and more than human. I have been privileged to learn alongside and from the trees, the water, the wind, and the moss. We cannot speak about food and the associated traditions without speaking to the roots of so much of post-colonial cooking. Without resilient enslaved peoples, we would not have food plants such as yams, okra, or black-eyed peas, whose seeds were cleverly concealed by braiding them into enslaved people's hair to bring them across the Atlantic. We would not have chocolate, peanuts, strawberries, avocados, corn, tapioca, maple syrup, vanilla, beans, or tomatoes, among so many others, without indigenous peoples in the Americas who carefully cultivated and developed these plants over thousands of generations. It is not only an incomplete picture when we leave these cultures out of our discussions of food. It is an act of cultural genocide and a poignant reminder of how deeply these so-called American and Canadian societies are colonial. 
Food is powerful. Food is political. As I enumerate all the foods these indigenous cultures have gifted us, I am reminded of how political every single meal we eat truly is. Whether you are eating organic vegetables from your own garden, cooking with ingredients from Savon down the hill, or eating fast food, you are participating directly in the political dimension of food. So much of our culture and humanity is wrapped up in the foods we eat. And this is the power of food. But food's political capacity also means that it can be weaponized. For example, when it comes to settler colonialism, our agricultural systems are extensions of European supremacy. Food, and more specifically access to and knowledge about food, has been restricted to alienate indigenous people and other communities of color from their respective cultures. One such example of colonial powers harnessing food, or lack thereof, is that of residential schools. In the 1940s and 50s, some of Canada's most prominent food nutritionists conducted horrifying, non-consensual malnutrition experiments on children in the Alberni Residential School. Children were purposely provided with significantly less protein and food than their growing bodies needed, and data was collected to see the effects of starvation on the human body. Not only were these children dislocated from their traditional foods and their families, but they were systematically starved. Similar experiments involved at least another 1,300 indigenous peoples across Canada. White curiosity was deemed more valuable than the lives of indigenous people. There's a chance that some of us in this room were children when these atrocities were happening. Or if you weren't alive yet, your parents or grandparents likely were. Or perhaps you had family members in these schools being starved. Your body may have inherited those traumas. My point here is that this is not the distant past. This violence is ongoing and reproduced through capitalism and our own actions regarding food. Right now, BC Timber is proposing to spray herbicides from Hope to Squamish for the next five years. These poisons would kill dozens of sacred species of plants, all of which many local indigenous peoples rely on for food or for medicine, not to mention that losing these integral plants would be devastating to the biodiversity of this land. Food has been weaponized in many ways, but it also offers us one key to the lifelong challenge of decolonization. In a world in which we are goaded to strengthen our ties and dependence upon corporations, private entities, and capitalism as a whole, it is a revolutionary act to teach children to cook, especially if their ancestors have suffered these violences. I have had the privilege and honor of loving a small school in Squamish called Squamish Nature Learners, which I will be calling SNL. I began volunteering with this land-based learning school as an extension of my schoolwork at Quest. Using indigenous knowledge to guide them, aided by several elders from the community, the teachers at SNL view land as a co-teacher, an entity the children could and should look to for guidance and ancient knowledge. In my second year at Quest, I fell in love with their vision of education and began teaching the children to cook while providing them all with a hot lunch. Since then, I have also been conducting at-home cooking classes with smaller groups of students. They have truly blown me away each time. They are inventive and curious and bold and coax the same out of me. As I taught them about food science and classic flavor combinations, they showed me how to push creative bounds and to embrace experimentation. It is empowering to feel such a symbiotic exchange, and it has served as a deeply invigorating political practice as I get to engage, watch them engage with cooking as a liberatory tool. I believe that they enjoy cooking with me because it allows them to play with their own agency. I provide blueprints in the forms of recipes and verbal guidance, but they always have the prerogative to accept or to reject it. They are learning to trust their palates, to embrace creative experimentation, and to take pride in their ability to problem solve, because that's all that cooking really is. They are also learning about how deeply intertwined food and land are. In our current society, it is far too easy for children to think that food is produced by grocery stores, completely separate from nature. This is precisely why land-based learning must be utilized when teaching and learning about cooking. 
This past year, I've been with Squamish Nature Learners again, but this time as an assistant teacher who gets to stick around for more than just lunch. I get to sing with them in the morning, warm their little red hands after they play in the snow, and walk with them through the forest while discovering new animal tracks. They are learning through their relationships to land and through their connections to one another. Because of land-based learning, they are able to see how nature provides gifts for us all. I get to see these children become friends with trees and care for salmon. I get to exist beside them while they discover the world. Though the earth is undeniably suffering, I can see hope on the horizon. I am looking forward to a future in which children see more of forests and rivers than they do of highways and strip malls. I hope to see school and class communities actively working to uproot the intertangled forces of colonization, imperialism, and capitalism, day by day and conversation by conversation. I see our future shaped by the stories we imagine today and guided by the stories passed down so carefully by our elders. I see intergenerational, interspecies, and intersectional learning shaping and informing our networks of care. I hope desperately to witness children playing alongside our more than human relatives, fully embracing their innocence and relishing the wonder of childhood. And I am not alone in these wishes nor in this work. Indigenous knowledge keepers, scholars, and elders know these lessons, and many people are working tirelessly to preserve the food and knowledge of their ancestors. Someday, I will lazily walk down to a stream, hip to shoulder with children, perhaps to see some salmon spawning, and we will hear the gurgle of the water people greeting us as we near the shore. We will play in the water and lounge on the land, making the most of the gleaming sun. I will model grace for them as best as I know how. I will make mistakes in my teaching. I will fumble and flail, but I will remain steady in my pursuit of nurturing students as well as their stomachs. I will see my own life wrapped up and reflected in theirs. I will be there when they fail, and I will cheer for them when they succeed, whatever success may look like for them. And each time I witness them growing alongside our wild relatives, I will be reminded of Robin Wall Kimmerer's gentle words. All flourishing is mutual. Thank you. Oscar? This is probably a tough question. Okay. <laughs> what can I do on an individual level to avoid propagating the recommendation of food, but also to help decolonize food? Yeah, okay. Big question, but also, like, yeah, I was anticipating this question because it's a good one. Um, well, first of all, I would say, like, education is definitely, like, an important first step, so maybe reading some of my sources here would be good, especially like um, Cajete is a really good source. Um, and then I always recommend uh, Braiding Sweetgrass, which I'm sure many of us have already read. But um, yeah, re making sure you understand how your power might be used to weaponize food or how you might be propping up the systems which weaponize food. Um, and then also, if you have the funds, redistribution is a really important part of my praxis anyway, my personal praxis, um, just because Unfortunately, under capitalism, like money is kind of power, so it's really important if you have like extra money to make sure it's going to people who are affected by these um, violences. But beyond that, getting to like the root of the issue um, and why I care about this work so much is educating children so that the future generations don't have to go through this and we don't keep band-aiding the issue, we get to the root of it. So I hope that's a close enough answer and we'll chat later. <laughs> Yeah, Gerhardt. So, personally, I should say Oscar took my idea. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, to be completely honest, I think you answered your own question. I think it, you just have to think about it in this really complicated, messy way. Like food will never be simple. Culture will never be simple. And it's okay that both of those things are true at the same time. We just have to make sure we're acknowledging them both and not erasing one. But thank you, that's an excellent question. Yeah, Freddie. Ooh, <laughs> that's so hard. Um, can I ask you first if you already have an answer for that? Cause no, no okay. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, maybe I, I love that question though. I will think about that. I will get back to you on it. Thank you. <laughs> Our final speaker of this session is Matt Vincent talking to us about uh, social media. Hello everyone, uh, thank you for coming to my Keystone presentation. Uh, my question to start this all off was, is I wanted to look at education in the 21st century. And I know this seems like a far way off from, from that, but we'll, we'll come back around to that. Uh, but to end it off, I, I ended up writing my Keystone on uh, social media use, specifically during COVID-19. Now a quick introduction. Social media has been part of everyday life for many people throughout the world. It is arguably one of the larger developments that we have seen in what many call the age of information. Whether it be through Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Reddit, Instagram, Snapchat, or any of the other numerous social media apps, everyone, apps, everyone is more interconnected with each other than ever before. Information easily flies in between each other at just the push of a button. Governments and lobbies have been looking at how this has affected our society uh, and the implications it might have. There is no doubt that there has been widespread use of social media has had a large impact uh, on society and how we interact with each other. In this analysis that I've done for my Keystone, I would like to explore what I feel are some of the unacknowledged or misinterpreted pitfalls that come along with the use of widespread social media. The topics that I will discuss in this presentation or a condensed version of my Keystone are who uses social media and what are their expectations of it, effects of social media in news circulation, false claims made with the subcategories of how sources uh, of misinformation spread, as well as bots and their place in all of it. Lastly, I'll bring in uh, how we start to fight misinformation and where the future might bring us with that. As I said, starting off with the demographic data, I'm gonna toss a couple graphs and uh, figures at you here. They're just a general idea of what I found in some censuses that I found online. To start off with, um, uh, a census about North American social media use shows that Americans reported about 23% of them use social media as a news source. 30% sometimes use social media as a news source, 18% rarely do, and 20% do not use it. The remaining 7% reported that they didn't get any news digitally. It was going to fall anyways. This slide here breaks down the some of the uh, social media platforms out there and the percentages of North Americans that use them specifically. Uh, the big one, Facebook, around 72% of US adults use Facebook, uh, with a 52% of them that use it also get news from that place. Another large one, although it might seem so, is Twitter, uh, with 23% of US adults using it and 17% of that uh, group using it to get news. 
Next, I have a further breakdown of the demographics that were available from the census. Uh, this isn't necessarily to point to one specific group and what they did. It's more just to understand that it's widespread in, in multiple areas and that it's not just one kind of single spot that's a problem. Social media effects uh, on the spread of news. The question can and should be asked why we have seen this shift towards media as a news source. A study done looking at the role of social media in news found that with the advent of social media as, a news, as news, there had been an adverse effect on, the, on a well-established print and broadcast media. This decline in print and broadcast media has led to a loss in advertising revenue and the consequent decline in quality of journalistic offerings. This decline has led to a new internet-based media that incorporates contributions by a broad network of self-selecting participants uh, that report, share, and distribute news. Now, this is a fancy way of that, of saying that uh, some examples of these things would be blogs, social media network sites like Facebook posts and, and Twitter, uh, as well as political forums. This decline has also led to other uh, effects in reporting news. It has been found that with the new prevalence of self-reported news, consumers now create news stories for their social networks, selecting and sharing those most worthy of attention filtering out irrelevant stories and items. This fil uh, filter contributes to news sources and social media sites uh, that have created a biased and uninformed news base that, can, uh, that consumers continue to trust and read. The paper found that this process is called bottom-up news, where consumers collaborate, uh, create, uh, collaborate uh, to create news stories, but heavily rely on opinion uh, and substitute the journalistic ideal of objectivity. One of the most problematic aspects of an infodemic that we have seen, or this, the infodemic, is that it creates information overload, which leads to information fatigue for online users. The user's capacity for paying attention to information is limited and tends to exhaust quickly. The problem with this exhaustion is that studies done on social media consumption and news consumption found that under conditions of information overload, users will avert to using mental shortcuts for assessing new information. Moving on to the big hurdle. This is the part that I spent the most time on, and that's mostly false claims. False claims have been, over, uh, have been ever present on social media platforms. They have been, uh, been seen in political discussions and other large debates. These false claims are a major contributor to the current infodemic that we have seen in the past several years. As more and more false claims are made on social media platforms, any useful information is buried under the, amount of, uh, the sheer amount of claims generated. This has led to heated debates on inconsequential subjects that have no basis in fact or reasoning taking up all the room and attention that important, relevant pieces of information could have occupied. This is reflected in a number uh, of vaccine-related claims uh, that have been debunked uh, by international fact-checking uh, organizations. It's important to note that between uh, the 11th of March 2020 and the 10th of March 2021, uh, just based off of Google fact-checking, over 1,000 COVID-related fact-checking claim, uh, claims uh, monitoring just vaccines and vaccines were tracked. This prolification of false misleading claims about COVID-19 vaccines is a major challenge to public health authorities around the world. As such claims sow uncertainty, contribute to vaccine hesitancy, and generally undermine the efforts to vaccinate as many people as possible. The massive amount of misinformation that has been contributed uh, uh, has come from false claims, has caused a large amount of resistance to vaccination as well as mask wearing and general quarantine. In certain communities, this has severely harmed the community's health. One of the major contributors to false claims uh, that have added to the information overload that we have seen are bots. Now bots, as I defined in my keystone, are coordinated in, uh, internet agents that simulate human activity to share content. These bots have been ever present uh, in the background uh, of the studies that I have looked in my, uh, at in my analysis. Numerous studies have touched on their presence in the data that they have collected, however, they have been left 
mostly unattended to. There are, uh, however, an underappreciated aspect uh, to the spread of misinformation that seem to have slipped past the public eye. During COVID-19, we've seen a shift in bot use to one more focused on COVID-19. And it has been one of the main contributors to the spread of misinformation and, mis and information overload during COVID-19. It has been found that the use of bots in one, uh, is one of the major reasons that we see the large quantity of low credibility stories or false claims make it to the forefront of social media. Accounts attributed to being bots, which are monitored based off of algorithms that find the higher than average use of keywords, are attributed with many uh, events that share these, these large low credibility stories. One great example uh, is something called a tweet, or that started the film your hospital, or hashtag film your hospital. The hashtag encouraged people to uh, visit local hospitals to take pictures and videos of empty hospitals to help prove that the COVID-19 pandemic uh, was just an elaborate hoax. Uh, this stemmed from just one user visiting their hospital and finding it nearly empty. The study found that while much of the content from the users was limited to, uh, limited, had limited reach, the auction that really fueled the conspiracy uh, was initially the uh, and it was initially in the early days, uh, first from bots targeting keywords, then a, help, uh, then a handful of prominent conservative politicians and far-right political activists on Twitter. Here is just a quick overview of the life of this hashtag. You can see the initial blip uh, coming from the bots really pushing it out and keeping it alive, and then as you see the giant rise in popularity uh, that's coming from the politicians picking up and resharing it. And with most stories that have these low credibility impacts, it's found that they're not picked up because there's hundreds of these that go out, only some of them stay alive and they're really attributed to this first initial kind of little blip and then the pickup from other large influencers. How we fight misinformation. Having explored the effects of misinformation uh, can have on a community, the question should and has been asked, how do we try to prevent the spread of misinformation on our social media platforms? Countermeasures uh, adopted thus far to curb the information disorder have, been, have had limited success because they, uh, they did not account for the diversity of information context on social media and the focused, and folks instead on curtailing to the factual content in, uh, involved. The argument has been made that current countermeasures are insufficient to, uh, to combat the information crisis we are experiencing. The idea is that content-focused measures do not address the primary cause of the infodemic. Namely, the users need to post content as a way of making sense of their situation, even if that situation isn't necessarily based in reality. These are some current practices that we have. There are current measures that are in place to try and curb the stem of uh, curb and stem the uh, of misinformation. The tide of information come from social media uh, that comes from social media platforms uh, are are all reactionary um, and all based on on just a few platforms that have really tried to push it down, like Twitter and Facebook. Countermeasures adopted thus far, sorry, no. in recent years, social media platforms have been testing uh, methods of content curt uh, curtailing by using external fact-checking organizations, flagging the misinformation content and sometimes removing it. In the wake of COVID-19, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, these efforts for fact-checking were accelerated to the to an impressive impressive extent. Uh, the number of English language fact-checkers rose more than 900 percent, which is a large amount, in just a several months' time. The table above shows uh, the measure, some of the measures that have been taken by social media platforms to uh, counteract the misinformation uh, and false claims spread. The problem is, however, is that, as I stated, these are all reactionary solutions to the problems that we have seen. Moving on to the last little bit, looking to the future. Now, as I stated, I wanted to talk about education in my question, and this is where I've come to. 
the idea that reactionary methods aren't working has kind of been prevalent in most of my research. And it's stated and, and kind of theorized that the only way to deal with this is more of a, a proactive method where we look at educating younger age groups in ways that they can properly interact with this in, uh, incredibly powerful tool that they have at their fingertips. And so that has been the kind of focus of my question and my keystone is looking at how our lack of education and understanding of how to use this platform, these platforms has led to a large impact on our social and mental health and how we need to look at potentially introducing methods to combat that. Thank you very much. Yeah, great question. A really good question. So I started my question, uh, my my time at Quest, being like, ah, I don't really know what I wanted to do. And my first thought was, I want to I want to educate, in a way that focuses on some of the struggles we have, in the 21st century. And and when I think of the 21st century, I think of the information age, right? Uh, and so I did some research, and I was like, holy crap, there's a lot of information out there, and there's no way anyone can interact with it properly without some some sort of education on how to, um, and. I, I did some research, found that you know a lot, not, not a lot of people went to college uh, after they graduate high school, right? Uh, and so I figured, well, there's probably some lack of knowledge or understanding on how to interact with that. And then along came COVID, and I was like, you know what? People aren't really dealing with this very well. Uh, and as I was looking up information on, on you know, conspiracy theories and all that, it just kept coming up to COVID. I was like, well, may as well lean into it. Uh, and so that's kind of how this came about. Uh, it was more focused at the beginning on just general uh, understanding that we need some sort of reason to educate uh, on these things, and COVID was just the best example at the time. Oscar, yeah. So, like, obviously, disinformation is not that new phenomenon. <laughs> Propaganda has been this for a really long time. Yeah. That's a hard one. Uh, yeah, no, I, I like it. Um, so I think, I think it's, it's twofold. Uh, one, you know, it takes a story that your uncle might tell you uh, at, over dinner about how he thinks, you know, Area 51 is holding aliens, for example, right? And then, you know, you turn around because you're 12 and you think that's a great story and tweet it to your friends and then your friends tweet it to each other, right? And so that, in some extent, makes the story larger and easier to spread. Uh, and I know, you know, Area 51 aliens isn't the, the best example of conspiracy theories, but it's, eh. um, But the second one, too, is I think it, it lets people who are actually knowledgeable about how to use this platform reach so many people who aren't so, so easily. Uh, so the example I gave with the, um, I can jump back to it, this one here, uh, it, it really picked up once major influencers started using it, right? And so it's, it's become a job uh, in societies. People get large followings on social media, social media accounts and they're paid money to sponsor certain, uh, or, or get sponsored to, to sell you certain things, right? And so it's most definitely come along in a way that we necessarily don't understand uh, as a large community. Some individuals most definitely use it to their advantage. Um, and, and that's kind of my problem is we're being exploited in ways we don't really understand. Um, yeah. Did that answer the question? Awesome. <laughs>